mission at the Environmental Study Center is to educate students and the general public about the role that the animals play here in our local ecosystem and the environment. So we have a mature red-tailed hawk. Her name is Maverick, and she was transferred to us from a rehab center here in the state. The, the bird came in after being injured and was non-releasable due to an injury. So she is one of our creature teachers, I guess you could call her. And uh, she teaches about the importance of habitat for birds of prey and um, our consideration to keep them from being injured. Maverick here, she has an injured wing and we have to assume that uh, she was hit by a car. You know, a lot of times these birds, they're hunting along the roadways, they're sitting in the trees, they're perching, and uh, a lot of small mammals are coming up to the sides of the roads uh, and they're feeding, whether they're the uh, nocturnal birds of prey, the owls, or our diurnal birds of prey, uh, our hawks. And uh, so, uh, mice and rats and other small mammals are coming up and they're looking for food. A lot of times it's food that people have thrown out of their cars, whether it's, you know, french fries or, or pieces of hamburger or the banana peel, whatever the case may be. And especially at nighttime when the owls are coming and then those headlights, they disorient. They, it's a bad encounter. So that's how we end up with a lot of these birds. They're perfectly healthy. They can, uh, they have a great quality of life. They just wouldn't be able to survive on their own anymore. Just like with uh, with Maverick here, she's a great bird that we can yeah, use to educate people yeah, on that. And uh, she's, she's well behaved, well mannered. And so if we can incorporate them into our educational program, then that's what we do. And they're, so they're great ambassadors for that. Some of the things that they encounter as far as hazards in the wild is man-made. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's the human interactions that they have to deal with for the most part. Uh, we talked about the cars. Uh, and now, if we had to pick a, a, a secondary source, it would probably be loss of habitat that they have to deal with. And so, you know, just like with a lot of the other animals in the wild, whether it's the birds of prey or, or reptiles, the gopher tortoises and other things like that, now it's, it's, it's loss of habitat. So that would probably be, at least for them uh, and other birds of prey, is that's the main thing that they have to deal with now. We have Luco here and you can see that his beak is, uh, is twisted. He was found in the nest when he was a baby. Um, yet eagles have been taken off the endangered species list. Of course, they're still protected, but when they were endangered, scientists were going around and they were doing inspections, uh, looking for the babies and seeing how healthy they were. And of course, Luco was found uh, in the nest as a baby this way, his, his beak was deformed. And so uh, we believe, uh, scientists believe that this was a result of some type of, uh, of chemical, and so that's why we have Luco. And uh, we have an issue, of course, in this area with uh, residual DDT uh, that's left in the water. And uh, so that, that can affect eagles, ospreys, pelicans. We have a pelican here even that has a, a beak. His beak is completely sideways. And so, you know, that's a concern that we have all around this area. We have a lot of chemical plants uh, up and down our rivers and uh, that feed into our, our bay and so we're always uh, aware of the issues that, that uh, we have to face with these types of animals and so that's just, uh, just one thing that we're always teaching and preaching to uh, our students and to uh, the general public as well and so this is a this is just one example of how we can use these magnificent birds, these uh, birds of prey uh, to teach how important it is uh, that we we are responsible stewards of our environment. He has, well maybe being the biggest bird of prey we have, he does come with the most personality and he was transferred to us about three years ago and so the biologist Susan and I, we've been working with him since he was transferred to us and he does seem to know one person from the other at times and and um, of course, we had to spend a lot of time getting to know each other. At first, we could you know, hardly get him to really come to us. And, and now he knows us and he'll just step up. But he, uh, he's, he's interested in things around him and he's, he's got a strong, strong will and strong personality. When he wants to sit and do, he'll sit. But then sometimes if he wants to jump and flap, he will. He does a really good job during presentations of showing off that wingspan. And I may be able to get him to show a little bit of that wing. So he's got a really nice wingspan when he decides to stretch out. But he's been in captivity his whole life and he's about 18 years old. So he has been a bird that's been teaching about the environment and birds of prey in the environment his whole life. So he's very comfortable in what he does.
Now in captivity, he can live up to 40 years. But birds of prey in captivity have a much easier life than those out in the wild. So in the wild, they're going to deal with competition between their species for food. They're going to try to not be, you know, hit by a car, um, injured by, by people. There are some people still that uh, take aim at birds of prey because historically we've, we've, some people haven't liked birds of prey because they hunt the, the small game animals and, and things of that nature. But he'll, he'll be with us for quite some time. I'm Mike Studer with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. We're in Nashville at the Ellington Agricultural Center. I'm the state apiarist. I'm in charge of the bees in the state of Tennessee, making sure that they're healthy and keeping disease problems down, make sure we have enough bees to pollinate all our crops successfully so that we have a food source. The types of pollinators we have in the state of Tennessee, we have honeybees, which is a European species. It's not native to North America. We have bumblebees. We have many species of native bees. Uh, there's several thousand species of native bees in the state of Tennessee, which most people don't, don't realize. Uh, we have orchard mason bees, uh, we have leaf cutter bees, we have some carpenter bees are pollinators. Most people don't like them because they destroy their decks and things like that. They are pollinators, they do good. Um, we have a lot of ground nesting bees, solitary bees, the pepinapus, the squash bee that pollinates squash. There's just a lot of them that we have in the state of Tennessee. The beehive consists of the bees, our colony actually is what you call them, um, consists of the bees and the boxes, the woodenware that's with it and the frames that are inside it. No matter how many boxes you've got on top, uh, it includes one queen, uh, probably this one here's probably got about 60,000 workers in it and I got one up in my face talking to me. Um, and this time of year they'll have drones, and the only thing the drones do is they mate with the queen, the new queen when she comes out, when they make a new, a new queen. So that's what a colony is. The thing with the bees being like a canary in a coal mine, they're an indicator species of um, quality of habitat, uh, the health of the environment. Not only honeybees, but native bees. You know, all the bumblebees and the other native bees. We're seeing the same kind of decline in the native bees as we're seeing in the honeybees. But it's harder to sample the native bees and find out what their populations are doing. It's easier to go to the beekeepers and see how many colonies did you lose this year? You know, what's going on? So the, the honeybees, European honeybees, are a good indicator of, of what's going on in the, in the world, basically. Um, if they go, we go. It's, they pollinate a lot of the small plants, the herb, herbaceous plants that provide seeds for things like quail, um, deer. It's, if you lose all the bees, you start seeing declines in everything. So you, you have to have bees, whether it's honeybees or native bees, but honeybees, you can put them and have numbers that you need. If you've got something you need pollinated, you can put them out. And anybody can plant a pollinator mix. You can buy them online, you can go to any of the major seed companies and get them. Go and talk to the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency here, which is the TWRA. They have seed plot mixes that you can put out for both deer, turkeys, and pollinators. It's got pollinator flowers in it. It's got things in there that the, the bees will come to, like uh, buckwheat. And as you can see, European honeybees are not aggressive. I'm standing right in the middle of a bunch of them flying in and out. It's not something terrible. A lot of people have fears of bees. Uh, because they see them, they see them flying around them, they think they're going to get stung. As long as you're not doing fast movements, the bees are not really worried about you. You're not in their house, you know, you're not bothering them what they've got. So they're not going to bother with you. They're, they're a gentle creature for the most part. You know, you can, as long as you don't squish one, smash it, they don't want to sting because they know if they sting, they die. So you can, you can get them walking on your hand, you can get right here and let them do this. You, know, it's, you get in their flight path and they'll get all over you, but they're not going to sting you. They'll walk all over you and just walk around. They're not aggressive. They're very gentle. Uh, that's the kind of bees you want in your neighborhood. You want, you want around you. You don't want aggressive bees.
My name is Jay Williams and I run Williams Honey Farm and today we're at Green Door Gourmet. Uh, we're in the hilltop section which is where they grow squash and peppers and tomatoes. So we're surrounded by all organic uh, fields uh, where a multitude of crops are grown and these solitary bees, also known as leafcutter bees, um, are helping to pollinate the crops here. Leafcutters go out and they will actually chew a small, about dime-sized piece of leaf um, off of a plant and then they'll put it in here and they'll build a little cocoon with it. Um, they'll lay a little bit of pollen, a little bit of nectar mashed together and lay an egg um, and then they'll sort of work their way out to the end of that tube and go out and, uh, and keep on pollinating. They pollinate about 100 to 1 potential. So that's what we're doing today. We're actually putting more leafcutter bees in here, kind of bumping up the population and helping to boost the crops here at Green Door Solitary bees, believe it or not, are native. So they've been here for eons and they are all around us. These bees are very sensitive. Uh, to smell. So if there's a lot of chemicals, they actually, they'll just take off and fly away. And it's one of the reasons that I think a lot of people haven't seen them in their backyards as much as they could is because we don't know any better. Uh, we're all spraying Roundup all over the place because that's what you do, right? You need to treat your backyard as your pet. Um, you need to take care of it. You need to nurture it because these bees are talking to us. The honeybee is the modern day canary in my opinion. It is talking to us. It's telling us something's going on. Whether it be neonicotinoids, whether it be um, a basic uh, chemical that we're all using that we don't know any better, uh, the bees are getting harmed and we don't exactly know why. All right, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take these leaf cutter bees. You can take these leaf cutter bees. You can see a lot of these have hatched out. Um, these things right here are, um, are cocoons that haven't quite hatched out yet. Uh, obviously, they're made of little leaves. Um, and if you look here, these are spent cocoons. So this is what um, I put out about a week ago or so. And what we're doing today is we're just sort of boosting the population. We're just sort of adding some more uh, bees here to help them overlap their pollination time. The great thing about uh, leafcutter bees is they don't sting. Uh, so you can put them around schools, you can put them around uh, city parks, uh, anybody. You don't need uh, any sort of protective equipment whatsoever. Um, so it's kind of really fun uh, to play with them. They're almost like flies. You would barely even know they're there. Um, and these guys, when I open this bag, they're going to fly all over. And I'm not really worried about trying to collect them because they're going to come right to the thing that smells really good. It smells like home. See them right there coming out? They're flying all around us, but guess what? They're not stinging us at all. So what they're doing now is they're trying to figure out, all right, where's home? What's going on? Where do I need to figure out? Where'd I park my car? And, uh, and then after that, they're going to uh, mate with each other. So there was males and females in there. Um, they're going to mate and they're going to try and pick their hole, pick their home, uh, and, uh, and then start pollinating right away because they're hungry. Uh, we've actually incubated these in a little, um, little cooker and uh, about 19 days or so, 18, 19 days and they hatch out um, and you can actually pinpoint exactly when a certain crop is going to bloom. My name is Jeff Falco. I'm the Gold Star Father of Staff Sergeant Chris Falco, uh, United States Army Special Forces soldier that was um, killed in Afghanistan on August 8, 2005. Uh, we're out here at Fox Hollow Golf Course, a place that's very, very special to me and my and both of my my sons. Been working out here for 22 years. Uh, we're, I'm a greenskeeper pretty much working on the maintenance staff, doing whatever needs to be done, but uh, I prefer mowing greens because it's, uh, it's good exercise and, and I get to be out in nature and see the beautiful sunrises uh, and be around uh, all kinds of, of, of creatures that, that make my heart sit and smile. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredibly tranquil and peaceful. Um, in, in a world of craziness, uh, with day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day stresses, 
this is kind of my happy place. I, I, I come out here in the morning and I can, you know, be, commune with nature and, and be part of uh, some amazing things. Uh, for me, the thing that I enjoy most is, is seeing all the birds of prey out here. Um, we have had, uh, like I say, we've had eagles, um, uh, red-tailed hawk, uh, Swenson hawk, but for me and for my family, uh, the peregrine falcon is, is, uh, is my favorite bird. Um, we are Native American, and when I was about 10 years old, my dad sent me on a vision quest. Uh, three days after I got up on the mountain, I saw uh, a peregrine came to me and, and, and talked to me. It was uh, very spiritual. And ever since then, whenever I need help, uh, I see a peregrine. And it's, it's been pretty special. Uh, the peregrine is, is, is my spirit animal. Uh, he comes to me when I need, need to see him. And, and, uh, and this is a place where he happens a lot. connects me with not only my dad, but also my son. And uh, my dad died when I was 14, and my son died 12 years ago. And uh, the peregrine is, is a, a link between both of them. And that, uh, yeah. uh, about eight months ago, I went to a ceremony for a elementary school that became a Purple Heart school and it was the first one in Colorado and at that event uh, there, they, there was the organization called Hawk Quest came and they brought a bald eagle and I mean I'd never been that close to a bald eagle before and I actually had a picture taken with with uh, Magisawa right over my left shoulder and I talked with the uh, the guy who runs his name is Ken Kitagawa, and we had an instant connection. And he said to me, you know, I don't normally offer this to people, but why don't you come out to, uh, to where, where our muse is, out in Parker, Colorado, about to, you know, town next door to me. Uh, I'd like to show you, show you all the birds we have. And I was like, I'll be there tomorrow. So I ended up going out there uh, the next weekend, and it was... Uh, phenomenal. There were 38 uh, birds of prey and uh, when I was there it was like my this is where my soul needed to be. Uh, so I started volunteering uh, working with Ken. Um, you know I had had back a, about four years four or five years ago I had the opportunity to actually catch some birds of prey and ban them and tag them up in Vermont and I got to hold a peregrine falcon in my hand. And, and this animal looked into my soul. And I was something that I was, I, if I ever get the opportunity to do this again, I wanted to, and, and here's that opportunity. And so yesterday I actually had a Harris's hawk on my arm and uh, I'm getting ready to start training to, to hold it eagles. You know, so by the time September comes, and it's July now, um, I will, when we have the Medal of Honor Convention come to Pueblo, Colorado, uh, I will be able to, uh, to stand there with uh, these amazing men, uh, over 40 Medal of Honor recipients, and will have uh, their picture taken with me holding an eagle behind them. In, in the Native American culture, in our belief system, uh, we have an amazing connection with the birds of prey. Um, their spirit, is part of our spirit, you know, our spirit soars with them. And that's part of the reason that having eagle feathers and, and feathers from birds of prey adorn ornaments and, and weapons and horses and teepees is very, very special. Um, only Native Americans can have eagle feathers. It's, it's very special and very spiritual. Uh, the other thing is, the, the other reason that they don't give feathers out is, is birds of prey use feathers from other birds for their nests. And so um, that's one of the things that, that we do at Hawk Quest is we, we allow you know, these feathers to be used as, a, as they're intended. You know, my dad was Lakota, 
and uh, we didn't he didn't talk a whole lot about it when I was when I was young but our name means the little falcon in Lakota and uh, and so so that has been a very very special thing for me uh, when I got out here and I saw all the peregrines uh, and like I said I've been here 22 summers um, you know this was like okay this is where I need to be and part of the reason that the peregrine is so special to me is in, not not just because of of what happened when I was a kid um, but it's it's the fastest animal on the planet and uh, it, it it does things that other other birds can't do and and that reminds me of Chris no, so. so it was Father's Day probably 10 years ago, maybe a couple years after Chris died. And, uh, and I was out here and I saw a peregrine teaching its young um, how, to, how to hunt. And, and I got to watch this training on Father's Day um, of a dad teaching a, its young uh, bird how to, how to hunt. And I uh, was able to, to get, uh, so I found one of his feathers in the, in the fairway here behind me. So I picked it up and, and actually put it in the, on the frame of, uh, of the picture that Mike Reagan drew of Chris. So right, right below the, the, the picture of a peregrine. So it was, it was pretty special. As a father, it brings me I learned a lot from my dad, and I tried to take the lessons that he gave me and taught me with my kids. And, uh, and so to be out here and see parents teaching their young uh, birds how, 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 to, how to be birds, how to, how to be raptors, how to, how to hunt, uh, because that's, that's what these birds do is they hunt. And so to be able to, to see that over the course of the spring, um, how, they, how they learn to fly and how they learn to hunt. And because uh, we have so many creatures out here that, that they have opportunities to, to eat. Um, and predators become predators, predators be, learning to be predators. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, uh, and so I get to see that in, in nature. And now I'm able to, you know, to see and work with uh, uh, with Ken out at Hawkwest and, and, and teaching uh, teaching them how to fly and how to hunt as well. So it's, it's amazing uh, being able to see it firsthand. Uh, and you know, I mean, it's it's very it's spiritual. It's been part of my life, my whole life, and 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 to be able to to see it in in real time here uh, over the, you know, over the last 22 years, um, you know, most people don't get to see that. Uh, it's worth it. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, people ask me, you know, you get up every morning at three o'clock and yeah, I mean, I wouldn't miss this for the world. Uh, to get to see the sunrise, to get to see, you know, hear the ducks and hear the peregrines and hear the hawks and, and, uh, stuff.